Hi, hi, hi. Welcome to this lovely, lovely event. My name is Kai. I'm a member of the social media fleet here at Mysterious Galaxy. And today we are celebrating the release of Nicola Griffith's book, Sphere. Look at this awesome cover. So amazing. <laughs> So Nicola Griffith is the founder and co-host of Cripplet and is the author of seven award-winning novels, including Hild and Ammonite. In conversation with Nicola today is someone very special to her, her wife, Kelly Eskridge. Kelly is a New York Times notable novelist, short story writer, and a screenwriter with an award-winning short fiction collected in Dangerous Space. An exciting reminder that the book and signed book plates are available through the Mysterious Galaxy website. And thank you, Nicola, for doing that. You can find the link for that in the shiny green box below that reads by Spear and signed book plates here. Always remember that your purchase of books through Mysterious Galaxy helps us as an indie bookstore to keep doing wonderful events such as this. And lastly, Nicola and Kelly will be doing an audience Q&A around the 30 minute mark. So be sure to submit all of your questions to the ask a question tab below. And so I know you're not here to watch me talk, so I'm going to disappear in just a moment. Without, a, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Nicola and Kelly. Hi, everybody. Hi. Excuse me while I first just for a minute. I'm getting some oh. terrible echoes, so I've just switched to these and I'm still getting the echo. So I'm not mm, okay. entirely sure. You sound good from this end, and um, it's great to see everybody in the chat. So if you're having any trouble hearing or experiencing any kind of sound bounce from Nicola, please do drop a comment in the chat so that we can do our best to uh, to do technical things at the same time that we're talking. We'll see how that goes. I think it's just me that's bouncing. It's weird. Okay. All right. Can you cope? Will you be all right? Um, no, I'm not sure I can. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm, seriously, it's driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. How would you feel about taking your um, AirPods out and just working with the uh, speakers? You're on mute now. You're on. You're on mute. You're on mute. Folks, if you'll excuse me for just a moment, I'm going to step into the other room and see if I can help. I'll be right back. I'm really not. Oh, that's what I was doing. Go for it again. Let's see how it goes. Can everybody hear me? I can hear myself twice. It's driving me quite. All right, well, how about if we soldier on and if it really gets to be too wacky, then um, perhaps I can bring you some wired earbuds and maybe that will be better. I don't think that's it. And I'm not sure what okay. it is though. So. All right, anyway, we'll, we'll let's get started and see how we go on. Thanks everybody for your patience. We really appreciate it. Um, these, these days of, virtual events and hybrid events. Kai and I were just talking about how wonderful it is. It's so inclusive. We can all gather together. And also there's always the, the fun of technology. So thanks for rolling with us and we'll go ahead and dive in. Um, it's really great to be here and to be able to talk with Nicola and talk with all of you about Spear. Um, I'm gonna speak for both of us about how great it is uh, to be invited and thank you to Mysterious Galaxy for having us. Mysterious Galaxy is an amazing bookstore. And um, one of the things I would like to ask you to do is to please consider buying a book from Mysterious Galaxy and support this wonderful bookstore full of amazing people. It doesn't have to be anybody's book on this call, um, but please show your support if you can. And thanks again for being here. Nicola, is there anything that you would like to say uh, before we get started? No, just that I'm very happy to be here. Great. 
So Nicole and I have known each other a long time. And for as long as I've known you, you've loved stories of Arthur and Camelot. And in all that time, you have expressed zero interest in ever writing one. I feel <laughs> like the word never might have been used at some point. So I certainly was very surprised by this book. And I would love for you to talk about why now for an Arthur story and why this particular story? Let me see if I can do this while hearing myself three times. Um, I, I, I'm turning my sound off, okay. except I'm not. I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm having a really hard time concentrating. I, I tell you what, why don't, um, why don't I come in there and sit next to you and we can do the sound through the speakers without our ear pods. I'll okay. try it that way. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry about this people really never happened before. Let me see if I can. Okay, how does that sound? We're still getting the echo. Mm -hmm. Can you cope? Yep. So, can you uh, go ahead and open up the chat so that we can make sure that everybody else can hear us fine? Great. One more time, folks, how's it sounding? Okay, super cool. So it's just, just this setup then, yes. and I really don't understand. It's you. Mm -hmm. That's okay. So we talked, we've talked a lot about Arthur's stories and I was surprised that you chose to write this one. So why this story about Arthur and why now? This story and now are, are very much bound up together. Um, basically, I was asked to write an Arthur story um, by uh, Jen Northington and Swapna Krishna. And they they wanted me to do a short story for a race bent gender inclusive anthology of uh, queer Arthurian retellings. And I said, well, no, because I don't think it can be done. <laughs> because, you know, the matter of Britain of, of which the Arthur cycle is a huge part is um, it's a national origin story. So, so it, this whole nativist supremacist uh, manifest destiny thing is, is completely baked in. It's very difficult to, to break it open and make it about real people. It's, it's all about straight white manly men um, who were born to lead and it's all about how Britain became Britain, and that's why white people rule the world. And it, it's it's a really, really, really difficult thing to break open. And so I didn't want to do it. I um, uh, I said I said no. Um, and then they asked again, and I was uh, going to say no again. Went into my head, fell this this vision. Uh, of a, a person on horseback wearing really, really tatty armor and carrying a red spear and it was a bony horse. So clearly this was a, a not well off person. And I thought I can do something with that. For whatever reason, I suddenly thought this is going to be something really interesting. So I found out what the deadline was for, for the story. And they said, no, it's not till February. So I said, great, plenty of time. And uh, went back to what I was doing, which was researching Meanwood, the big book I was working on, and uh, forgot all about the story. Uh, and then they 
talked to me uh, in February and said, where's the story? And I said, hold on, I'll get right to it. And um, sat down and started working on it. And and then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was going to be a short story. I, I really thought we were going to be, you know, maybe 10 or 12,000 words. But I blew past 12,000 words in three days, which is not my usual pace, because it, I was just full of, of this, this fire, I, I, because it was what I was making was really different. It was it was not like what I was used to. I, I need to turn and face you or you oh, need to sit next sure. to me, because I keep looking at you in, in, the, in, the, in the screen. But I just don't want you, I don't want you, everybody to see your profile for the whole time. So how about if we do this a little bit? Okay. All right. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. All right. So why was this different? Why was? You said it was different, that, that it's the pace and, and you, you kept going and you knew that it was something different or special. What, what were you thinking or feeling when you were working on this? Because I know from the outside you were consumed. I felt like I was um, riding a runaway horse. It was... Um, I have loved the matter of Britain my whole life since I was about eight and first read it. And... I never thought I would be able to work with it. I this, There was this whole notion of the landscape of long ago that I loved, the mist on the moors, the standing stones, this sense of kind of mystery and that the feeling that the world, the real world and the supernatural world were very close together. It, those, those fictions always felt wonderful to me and I really wanted to do that. But I had never really been able to. But as soon as I started working on this story, it happened. Suddenly, I was in this magical place. And, and even the language was not like any language I've really used before. It was really kind of Celtic language. It was rhythmic and rippling and periphrastic going back in on itself. And it just unfurled like a carpet. It was, clearly I'd been thinking about this story on some level for a really long time. I just didn't know that that's what I'd been doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so much old Arthurian stuff fell into my head while I was working. I was pulling in stuff from everywhere. I was pulling in I mean, people call the matter of Britain a British myth, but really it's very English. It's, it's designed and built to serve English people in power. Um, and so one of the first things I did was deliberately bring in Welsh history and then Irish myth. And then I even threw in a couple of Picts. So we've got some Scottish people in there. So it's just sort of opening the center a bit, broadening the center to make it actually British in this way, because it really is a, a British story. But I wanted it to be a British story without doing that British supremacist thing, without saying that you have to basically have been born and played on the playing fields of Eton in order to be anybody. So there's lots of real people in my book, you know, people of color, queer people, disabled people, poor people, and so on. Mm -hmm. And Peritier is certainly not your typical Arthurian hero. That's true. Mm -hmm. So she, I want to talk about the idea of heroes a little bit later, but the first thing that we learn about Peritier right in the first paragraphs of the book is that she is a girl growing up nameless in the wild, which is like an actual phrase that has always stuck with me, um, having read it and having heard you read it. 
so I'm curious, why, why did you make that choice? She, she doesn't even have a name and she's out there alone with her mother. Hmm. I could probably make up a story about why, but the real truth is I have no idea. Um, it just happened because the story brain, hmm. it, it's a bit of a, a black box. Um, I don't know why. To start with, I, I wasn't really sure why she was nameless. Um, it became clear, obviously, mm -hmm. the, the, the I had a plot going on and I knew what I was supposed to be doing, but that first idea went into the back of my brain and then just started accreting things while I was doing other stuff. So when I pulled it out and looked at it, it, it was much sturdier without my conscious effort. Um, so the naming thing is very much, that's a very much part of the whole mythology and magic stuff, like naming calls. So I brought that in. But also, in a way, Peritia finding her name mirrored my writing work because it was finding Peritia's name that really helped me break this story open because it was the etymology of her name, which comes from beer, which means hard, and hudir, which means spear. So berhudir, as in peritia. That is what gave me all the information I really needed. And as for why she grew up um, in a cave, with her mother away from everything. That is because um, that made Peritier an innocent, uh, naive in a particular way. So um, she wasn't, she didn't absorb all the cultural bias. She didn't realize that being a big, strong, poor, woman who loved other women was anything odd at all she 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 wasn't she didn't talk to other people the only only person she ever talked to until she met people connected with king arthur was her mother she didn't talk to a single other person she talked to well actually that's not true mm -hmm. Actually, the first person she talked to was a farm wife who thought she was a man and um, came onto her pretty hard and Peritia freaked out and ran <laughs> in the middle of the night going, ah, no, don't know what to do because she was young. You know, she hadn't quite figured out life yet. <laughs> she gets there, trust me. Um, but it made her, she didn't absorb any, any, uh, misogyny or homophobia. I'm mean, not that they would have called it that then, but in, in our modern terms, she didn't internalize any bias. So she felt perfectly fine doing what absolutely came naturally to her. Um, so she was self-confident and strong, and she was really free to be a hero, essentially. Which happens, of course, when she finally makes the choice to leave and she goes out on adventure and she goes out for particular reasons. Um, so what one of the things that I really experienced reading the book is this sense that as she learns more about well, A, that other people are there and B, how they operate and, and what their communities are like how they relate to each other. There's this kind of inevitable pull in the story that starts to happen and the pace changes. Mm -hmm. And she's, I had the feeling at the time that she was being drawn out into the world. But of course she ultimately makes the choice to go out into the world. So why does she leave? She leaves because she has, Peritier is, um, She's not like other girls in many ways. And one of them is that she has a very particular gift, which is that she learns things from nature. She learns to 
to smell things on the breeze and um, learn things from the feel of a leaf. She can read nature the way that we might read a book and it will give her memories of what had passed there before or where something has come from. It's a, it's, it's a very particular gift. And we don't find out why she can do that until later in the book. So I'm not going to spoil anything for you. But she does, in fact, know things that other people can't know. And it, it's something she gets very good at. But one of the things she learns as a child, I mean, right from probably, I've never thought about how old she was, but maybe six. She has smelt on the breeze this cold, clear lake somewhere and she doesn't know where it is all she knows is that one day she will find that lake and one day she needs to find that lake she has no idea why and so eventually when she leaves she leaves for two reasons one is because she wants to find her name because her mother has not yet given her her name and it's only literally if she's stepping out of the door not that there is a door because it's a cave but through the kind of little leather curtain. It's not until then that her mother gives her her name. Um, but really she's going to go find this lake because she knows it has something to do with who she is and why she is. So yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. why she leaves to go find it. And she doesn't find it right away. No, she has adventures with the farm wives and, <laughs> <laughs> and other things, yes, and other things. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know that you have a reading prepared and um, of something that happens once Parater is out in the world. So I wonder if you would set that up for us and read. Sure. Okay. So um, I think I've already said that she learns... Parity has learnt to hear in the rain and feel in the breeze things and that she's left and that she has what the thing I haven't actually talked about yet was that in one of her roams through her valley of Ustradtoi, which is the Welsh valley where she grows up in the cave, she stumbles across this body and um, from the body she takes this tatty broken armor and she takes two spears a boar spear and a javelin and a, also a broken sword so about three inches are missing from the sword um and she encounters the companions of arturus the king when she has left and she can sense that these people have a connection to this cool clear lake that she really wants to find and so she wants to join them she says hey basically can i can i be one of the gang and they say well no because we don't know who you are and uh you know we're heroes and you're not a hero you need to go make a name for yourself so she decides that's what she's going to do so she sets out uh by helping farmers who have been um lately troubled by bandits coming back to the land and then one day she hears about the worst bandit of all a blight on the land the red knight Peritier rode now through lands abandoned by people and sharp with the scent of vinegar where apples untended had fallen and rotted in the grass a good land and rich, but poisoned by fear. Midway across a cold, clear stream, she caught the thick scent of corruption and stopped. She loosened the rein. Drink deep, bony, drink your fill, for there may not be much ahead that was good and clean. On the far bank, she drank to bursting, then filled her leather bottle. She gave Boney the last beans mixed with oats, then turned him loose to graze while she saw to her gear. The blades were sharp, sharper than sharp and well oiled, but she oiled them again, even the pointless sword. She checked her mail coat, scale by scale, and put it back on. 
The leather cap she turned over in her hands. It was a little tight now. She might wish Boney were bigger and she might wish for a shield, but this is what she had. In Ustrad Toi, close to the bounds of Duvard, there was a blackthorn where shrikes spiked their prey, mouse pups and caterpillars, smaller birds and bees, a score of dead things drying to husks, hanging as a larder and a warning. The red knight had hung more. Bare alders and willows still clinging to their leaves grew on both sides of the ford, and the crook of every bough held remains, men, women, even children, two dogs, a goat, half an ass, and that was just the carcasses fresh enough to recognise. There were more, many more, that had rotted into strips of leather and old bone held together by a piece of armour, a boot or a sleeve. In the dappled light on the far bank, mounted on a giant roan, waited a man cased in red leather sewn with red enamelled iron scales, not just a sleeved jacket like the old thing Peritier wore, but also plate strips on his breeches, a high collar and gauntlets sewn with small plates on each finger. Even his boots were plated. The shield on his left arm matched. Red leather stretched over wood and painted with a black snake with golden eyes and tongue. Around its edge, another snake, this time of armoured scales glinted in the shimmering tree light. Boiled leather covered his horse's chest, face and neck. The man wore a massive war helm of red enamelled iron, a big two-handed sword sheathed on the left of his saddle and a great lance tucked under his right arm. Peritier patted Boney's shoulder and could not tell if her horse trembled or she did. Was this fear? She felt once again that first cool kiss of the dream lake. The lake was her destiny and her path to it lay through this night. She forced her war hat more firmly on her head and wished suddenly to see her valley again, see it on one of those precious sunlit days when forget-me-nots lay scattered blue in the grass and the light on the trees glowed like polished bronze. But then a fly lifted from the giant red lance and hummed over the water, and in the air stirred by its wing, she felt the strength of the arm that held that lance and the speed with which it could change the direction of the brutal tip, an edged blade as much as a point. With nothing in her hands but Boney's reins, she kneed him forward. The Red Knight's horse overtopped her own by two hands. Boney would not survive a blow to his head or neck from those plate-sized hooves. And that shield! She took a deep breath. I am Peritir, Paladir, here. She used her lungs large from years of running the valley and her gut muscles and her voice belled and boomed like a huge hound. In the name of Arturus, king, your life is forfeit. With Boney's first step into the river, the knight's memory of sharpening the scales around the shield rim unfurled in her mind like a scroll. When the knight kicked his own giant mount forward, its tail flicked an alder at the water's edge, and she knew from the scent of its bark that, Hidden from sight, another two spears were propped against its trunk, waiting. She kicked Boney into a trot and he splashed water high around him in a brave show. And with her knees holding him steady, she pulled out her boar spear, which she tucked under her left arm, then her javelin, which she held easy in her right. She swayed with Boney loose and lithe as the river, while the bandit knight bore down on her like a red tide. He was ferment and rot, wearing the gear of a prince, 
a wave of blood and rage. Send me strength, she called in her heart, kicked Boney to a gallop and hurled her javelin hard and true. It took the shield near its edge and swung it into his lance, nudging, nudging it off its line, just as she and Boney swept past inside the reach of the Red Knight's blade, close enough to feel the wind of the shield as it missed, then swerved and thrust her boar spear at his thigh, and they were past. Both horses turned. Peritia wiped at her jaw. Blood. Dripping down her cheek, the red shield had not missed. She put it from her mind. The knight shook his shield, but the javelin had burst through leather and wood and was unmovable. He threw down the shield and kneed his mount into a tight turn. He was bigger. His mount was bigger. His lance was bigger, and he knew this river. She could not win. But as he came, Peritia felt through her palm the wood of her spear, from the wood, the blade, and at the tip of the blade, a taste of blood. Not much blood, for she had barely pricked him, but now she could feel his life, feel the red knight as she felt herself. Now his knowledge was her knowledge. She felt his belly tighten as he lifted his lance a fraction and knew he planned to lower the point and take Boney in the lung. She felt the movement of his eyes as he searched for and found the telltale runnel of water where a hidden tree root might trip the unwary. Even as she felt it, she lifted Boney to a jump up over the root and pulled her tipless sword free. As his lance point dropped, she slashed down, taking off both blade and a handspan of shaft just before it slammed into Boney and sent him crashing down into the water. She leapt free, waist deep, boar spear in one hand and pointless sword in the other, and as the night thundered past, she swang again, hard, high up along the shaft of his lance, leaving him holding a stub. He tossed the stub aside and spurred his horse for the bank, for the tree and the hidden spears. She could not move fast against the weight of water, not as fast as a mounted man. So she did the only thing she could and hurled the boar spear across the horse's path straight into the bank. The roan caught its leg and went down. The red knight rose, a red raw mountain, rose and pulled his sword free from the thrashing horse. They stood opposite one another, she to her waist in the water, he with his back to the bank and only to his knees. She moved on a slant closer to the bank to where he knew, as now did she, that the river bed sloped up towards the grass. Now she was only thigh deep. They faced each other and the sun shone full on the bandit knight's face. His eyes were glass green, almost wholly green, with centres tight as pinpricks. I'll hang you he said in a voice harsh as gravel. I'll hang you alive, pinned by your own spear, but not through anything vital. I'll eat your horse while you watch, and every day I'll cut a piece from you and laugh as you rot and beg to die. And he waded towards her. She could do nothing but watch him come. She felt the power of his muscle against the weight of water, saw the length and weight of his sword, knew the strength of his armour, armour on his throat and chest and arms and belly and thighs. Her sword could not stab through that armour. It had no point. She would die hanging on his tree. Her legs trembled. 
she could not stand against him. So she did not. As the wake of his travel washed against her and that great sword drew back for a scything cut that would take an arm or her head, she breathed deep and dived flat under the water, under his blow, and slid the edge of her blade across the inside of his knee, where a riding man never wore armour, could not wear armour. He stumbled to one knee, and she pulled her pointless but razor sharp, oh, sharper than sharp, sword back along the inside of the other knee, slicing it open deep to the bone. He fell sideways, and she pushed herself up, breathing hard, to one knee and one foot, the foot on his sword trapping his blade, and thrust her own pointless sword down against his chest, pushing him under. As she got her feet under her, she shifted and lifted her sword and thrust down again, this time on the plate across his throat. She leaned her whole weight on the flat tip of the blade, leaned and leaned, gasping, holding on while he thrashed, holding on even as the water turned red around him and he went still. On, even as she sank, exhausted to her knees. Still holding, still leaning, until Boney, limping, nosed the back of her neck, and she fell against him, weeping, the blood running down her face, mingling with blood from the ragged tear on Boney's chest, and running with the river away. Thank you very much. I love that scene. I love the, I love the, the tension in it. And I'm very struck hearing it by the understanding that it's Paratir's first real experience of fear. Yes. Um, and I, hadn't really realized that and until I wrote this scene that that actually that's not true because there there's a scene slightly before that where she um takes two bandits to a local farmer and says here you go do do what you want with them I think these people are okay that they're probably not going to kill you you know I've beaten them up they're good you can you can use them as bond servants for a bit and um And then the she says, but but you know, what if they escape? And the woman's like the the farm wife says, Where would they go? And she says, Well, I don't know. And the farm wife realizes that thinks that Parity is a man, and it's like, Well, what would you know of fear anyway? You know, great galumph like you. And um and, and Paratia just doesn't really get it. She's like, she's never, she doesn't understand fear. She's never felt any because she's, she's never had to be afraid. She's never been taught to be afraid. And she's always been big and strong and fast. And she has this extra talent that makes life a little easier in many ways. Um, and so crossing the river and, and realizing that this red knight is just massive and well-armed and well used to killing people. It, it's a, a kind of astonishing for her. Um, and yet I didn't really want to spend too much time dwelling on, on how afraid she is because, because it's so new for her. I didn't, really want to spend all the time on it. I think she was more shocked by her mm -hmm. own fear than than afraid of her mm -hmm. own fear, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Am I making sense? You are, and it, it makes me want to have a whole conversation around the role of fear in, in a hero's, in any hero's journey. And having said that, we have already many questions 
uh, that people would like to ask. Mm. And I want to make sure that we have time for that because I know how much you love it. Yeah. Okay. So we can all come back to that if there's time. But um, I think for now, let's take a look at some questions. Why don't you look at those? Okay. Um, let's start uh, with the first one because Jane, I saw that your question was in very early. So I think that you should get the first answer. Um, so Jane has has a spear pin and uh, loves the design and can't remember the name of the blue flower. Uh, forget me nots, um, as in the um, the scene I just read. Um, forget me nots are the color of uh, Peritia's mother's eyes and they grow around the cave. So yeah. Definitely okay, forget me nots, great. and and the I don't know if how many people um, have been able to see this pin, but it's it's a beautiful pin that comes with the book. Okay. If if you are one of the people who are lucky enough to buy a book from a bookstore that has some of the pins, because not everybody does, but okay. Right, Jane. I hope that answers your question. Feel free to post another one if it doesn't. Um, so how do you want to handle this? Because I know that you can see the questions, but I know sometimes it's easier for you to hear them mm -hmm. than to read them. How would you like me to do this? I would like you to choose the question. Okay, great. Then I'm going to need your mouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why don't you take Let's see what a good idea. Oh my <laughs> God, it's movable. Who knew? Okay. I would love to um, then ask you about, because I would love to know the answer to this as well, Emily. Uh, Emily's curious about your repeated use of the word clean in describing Peritier's conception and understanding of everything, like the lake is clean, pure. Um, I'm putting words in Emily's mouth right there. Um, but in describing Peritier's conception and understanding of everything connected to the lake and Arcturus, the word clean does come up a lot. Can you talk about a little bit about what clean might have meant to her? Wow, that's a very interesting question. Mm. Um, I think clean to Peritier means clarity. Because she grew up with one person, and that was her mother. And her mother was very strange and kind of traumatized, essentially, almost broken. And, and so all Peritia wants is, is clarity. And to her, uh, clarity to, when it comes to water, it has to be very clear, has to be very clean. Mm -hmm. So I think it has something to do with that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a hygiene issue. I think it's more simple, clean, mm -hmm. clear. Well, she is uh, she's a very clean and clear character herself, mm -hmm. even as she's learning things that she didn't know and figuring things out that things that have troubled her, mm. but she still is in herself. Yeah, but but also clean in this way, it, it's more about if you cut something cleanly, it means really smoothly and simply, mm -hmm. not, not with a clean blade. I mean, you, clean is used differently. It's not a hygiene mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. At some point I'll have to go actually look at the etymology of all that and figure it out. Uh -oh. Okay. Emily, you have started a thing, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> okay, great. Um, then let's talk about, um, we have a question uh, from Cindy Lou. You haven't mentioned Percival yet, although, of course, this is a retelling of Percival's mm. story. So um, Cindy Lou would like to know if you were consciously recreating the Percival story in this book, or did the story happen and then you aligned it to personal? Bit of both. I think um, this is part of the subconscious writer's brain that the black box in the back of my head, that all kinds of things go in there. And I think there, there are things mulching in the bottom of that box that have, might have been there 50 years, you know, and then, then they get stuck to another idea. And so when I, when I, it's a bit like throwing an anchor from a ship. 
And depending how long the ship is there, when you pull it up, it's got all this stuff on it. It could, some of it could, might be seaweed, some of it might be somebody's skull from 200 years ago. There could be a bit of Roman statue. There's all kinds of things stuck. So I have read a lot of Arthurian stuff. As I say, I really, I loved this stuff since I was a kid. And so most of the stories are somewhere in my brain. And as soon as I realized that my main character was in fact Peritia, and, and Peritia was the analog of Percival, um, and I figured that out only because of, in that initial vision, the red spear. I thought, someone in tatty armor and red, that has to be Percival, except it was the sixth century with the armor, so it had to be Peritia. But already all these things were coming together. And given the fact that I wanted to bring in Irish myth, I wanted to align uh, everything to do with the, um, the Arthurian legend with the four treasures of the Tuha Dei, the, the she, basically. So the cup, um, the sword, the stone, and the spear. And um, the spear... Well, I think I've, I think I've already you've, you've talked, talked about, about the, the origin of the name, yeah, but you yeah. haven't linked it. Yes, but yet. so so uh, Peritier, I figured out that that Peritier could come from those two words, mm -hmm. um, and so then that made the Irish thing really easy. And Percival was perfect. Percival could be the spear, mm -hmm. and, right. and and Percival grew up poor. Percival grew up poor. Yes, mm -hmm. Percival grew up, uh, just brought up poor, uh, raised by his mother. By his so, mother. you know, mm -hmm. all, all fit together beautifully. Mm -hmm. But you didn't, you didn't start out trying to. No, I, did, I didn't, I didn't story. map it. I didn't right. go, oh, this has to connect. To this. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it? How, how the things come together and, and in, in an unconscious way. And then it's only afterwards that we sometimes can look at it and really see how the threads all weave together. It, it's, it amazes me, actually, how, how much um, things get tied together in one's head. I mean, if you look at a lot of my novels, it's all to do with Ammonites and Whitby, everything. I mean, even my very first novel, Ammonite, it's set on another planet, galaxy far, far away, all that stuff. And it has Ammonites in. And the reason that... I knew about Ammonites was because I had been to Whitby and Whitby is where I fell in love with the notion of Hild and Hild is how I really fell in love with the early medieval and the early medieval is where Spear comes from. It's like, mm -hmm. it's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cindy Lou, for your question. Um, so, Oh, I'm, I'm curious about the answer to this, too. Are there any hidden messages or Easter eggs for people who have read other of your books? Oh, I was thinking about this just the other day. Oh, there is something. And I can't think what it is. Oh, a new discovery for you. Mm. You'll have to read I, it I will. I will. Yes, I'll have to. Go <laughs> read, I will have to go read my own book. Um, but I will get back to you on that. But but there's lots of this. Mostly, actually, I just had fun with the jokes around um, spear enduring, and um, having K being such a basically K. Um, for I don't know how many people have read the book, but um, K is one of the companions of our tourists in this book, and he is such a dick. <laughs> But he's, but he's the kind of dick that I grew up with. He's he's a, a sort of bit of a an upper class twit, a beefy guy, plays rugby, the equivalent of playing rugby, slaps people. He's a manly man, you know. He's a bro, and uh, so he makes lots of jokes about Peritia's name about the name she's acquired, which is Spear Enduring. Oh, it's hard, Spear, ho, 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 etc. So there's this running joke through the whole thing. 
And in fact, the, the initial title of the book was Spear Enduring, except my editor said, well, that's a little um, bit viagra -y, don't you think? And I'm like, no. And then thinking, well, yeah, it's a running joke. So, but, but I saw his point. I said, well, let's just call it Spear. So. <laughs> Trust everybody to catch up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So we have another question about what audience are you hoping to reach with this book and and what oh, what message are you me trying to i want get people i want to reach people like me i fell in love with arthurian legend i loved the taste the smell um but what i really loved with the, was the notion of camelot and not camelot in a, in a particular time and not camelot as a particular place but camelot as a state of mind as a something outside of reality. Basically Camelot as a dream where people fight not for power over each other, but for the power to change the world in service of a dream. And the dream was um, justice, really. Justice and safety and equity. And I, I really wanted that to be mine. And I wanted it to be for people like me who are never allowed to be in that heroic past. I mean, that heroic past, I mean, Crips and queers and people of color have uh, been part of the world forever. We were here now, we were there then. And so I wanted us to be in these stories. And I'm losing track of the question. No, you're actually answering the question okay. um, right on target. Yeah, so so I wrote this book for people like me, for people like us here today, who are tired of not seeing ourselves in, in that heroic past. And and for people who, who are just tired of even being there as tokens, being there on sufferance. I, I wanted it to be for people like me who wanted to be the heroes of that time. So yeah, that, that's who I want this book to reach. So um, Kai, I'm gonna check in with you because we're almost at the top of the hour. How are we doing on time? You're doing great, you can keep going. You could uh, okay. hit the entire hour if you'd like. Yeah. Okay, okay. great, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so Emily has discovered the uh, the Easter eggs, um, the carnelian, and mm -hmm. uh, a pota perhaps a stealth ammonite. So thank you, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take um, Carrie. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, Carrie's question about the four treasures. Um, is there a parallel with the modern card deck, which is not a question I ever would have thought to ask. Well, you know, I expect there is, because, but I had never thought about it before. I don't really play cards much. I don't think about them. Um, uh, I, I've actually spent probably more time with the tarot deck than uh, ordinary cards. So actually, interesting. I wonder if the wand is really a spear. Hmm. Yep, that's um, worth thinking about. <laughs> so, 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 Carrie, you have also started something because now I can I can see your research wheels turning. So. Yeah. Um, so the four treasures, I actually have no idea. I'm sure there's scholarship about this somewhere, but I personally have no clue. <laughs> it's a great question. Thank you. So, um, hi, Kathy. It's nice to to see you virtually. Um, and Kathy's interested in the, um, if you're going by Kathleen these days, I apologize. Um, I'm, she's interested in the idea that, uh, about the role of fear in the hero's journey that we were talking about a little earlier mm -hmm. before we started taking mm -hmm. questions. Um, Peritia is a hero but she is a hero not in the Campbellian tradition. She's not a hero's journey kind of hero. Um, those heroes, 
I frankly don't have much time for those heroes. They they leave home because they have nothing. And so they're going to something better. They have this very linear journey. They head straight from here to their goal. And they just trample on people in, in who get in their way. And they're all about winning. And their journey is very linear. Um, they don't actually ever have any fear. Not that I recall, really. They, they're just like, oh, yep, yeah, I'm going to do that. I, I don't mm -hmm. ever... I think I feel like fear is in that kind of a journey is more of a, a modern construction, but certainly the, the the epic tales. Yeah, I mean the old, old school heroic tales. That you know, it's more about it's more about overcoming the externals, the monster. It's about killing the monster. I mean, right. the monster is the fear, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, that the the monster is the the externalized fear. Um, and Peritier just had no clue of the fear. Mm -hmm. Do you think? But uh, hold on a second. Oh. Having more thoughts, oh. <laughs> more things, more things. Um, but I do think it's a function of the modern novel, which is very much about the internal mm -hmm. feelings of the protagonist, as opposed to just looking at the hero externally. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, the hero's journey has changed, I would say. Good. Well, we are nearly out of time, so I think that is probably uh, a good place to leave us. Thank you all, Thank you all so, so much. much. Hi, everyone. I'm back. <laughs> Thank you to the both of you for this lovely, lovely event. I loved the reading so much. I wish you could have seen me because I was like this the whole time. Like, <laughs> it was so fun. All right. Well, before we go, I was uh, I wanted to ask, where can we find you on social media or a website? Um, I am. Hold on. I am Nicola Z, N I C O L A Z on Twitter. Um, and then my website is nicolagriffith.com. I, I do mostly things through Twitter and Instagram. I'm Nicola Griffith, at Nicola Griffith. Um, how about you, Mason? Um, I am Kelly Eskridge everywhere. So uh, at Kelly Eskridge on Twitter. I am on Facebook and I never go there. So if you are inclined to leave me a message, please understand that it will take me a month to see it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it's much easier to reach me on Twitter or through my website, which is kellyeskridge.com. Amazing. Well, thank you, Nicola. And thank you, Kelly, for this event. And thank you, audience, for being so interactive and for asking such great questions. Um, always remember, we're available right here in the green box for your for your um, signed book plates of Spear. So make sure to go get that before you go. And um, that's it from us. Have a great night or day wherever you are. All right, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Kelly.